Right, the question we're going to do is we're going to do, um, first off, we're going to do question 14, okay, which is a modal analysis problem. Okay, here's the problem. We've got a two degree of freedom system. Okay, there's no damping in this one, it's just uh, springs and masses. Okay, we've got uh, M and two, uh, 3M here, we've got K, 2K, and K. And we've got our X1 and X2 and F1 and F2. And what I've done is I've given you the spring stiffness and the mass. And I've given you the forces that's being applied, because modal analysis is very useful if you've got a forced multi-degree of freedom system. F2 is 0, and F1 is 6T. Okay, so it's a linearly increasing force with time. Now, I've saved you the labour of going through <coughs> steps 1, 2, and 3. I've given you the equation of motion. Okay, so there's my M, there's my K, acceleration, displacement, and my forces. I've given you the natural frequencies. And I've given you the mode shapes. And the question asks for, knowing these values, find the response of the system, i.e. x1, t, and x2, t, using modal analysis. So that's what we're going to do. So we've been given step 1, 2, and 3. So this is question 14. Steps one to three, tick, done. No door, mass. So step four, we have to find the modal mass. And for that, we use the equation I'll just write it in general form here. X I transposed times by M Okay, so that's the general form for the ith mode. <coughs> We've got two modes here, they've been given to us. And so we can find the first one, so M1 equals, so we take our mode shape and we transpose it, we've got 1 and minus 0 0.2638 Now we write our mass matrix, which we've got in the equation of motion, we've got 2, 0, 0 and 6 And we've got our mode shape again, 0 0.2638. And so you go through and you multiply this through, okay? Um, I won't go through all the steps, um, but you can... You can do that. It's often um, useful to start with these two, these two sides to give you a vector here and then multiply by the um, transpose of that vector. Okay, um, But what you should get is 2.4174 if you went through the process. Okay, That's mode 1. M2, we apply the same equation, but with the second mode. So we've got 1 here, then we've got There's my second mode shape. Uh, 
And again, you do the sums in the maths and the calculator, and you should get a value. So 11. Point five eight two six. That's step four. So we've got those two values. We then move on to step five. Which is to put rescaling the mode shapes. And for that we use the equation U Again, I'll do it for the general form. We take our mode shape and we divide it by the square root of m. These equations, by the way, these general forms, this one up here for the modal mass, and this one for the rescaling, they're on your formula sheet. So you don't need to remember the, the equations, you should remember in which step to use them. And so we find u1, we take our mode shape, x1, so we've got 1 divided by the square root of our um, modal mass. 2.7414414714 and we've got to minus 0 0.2638 divided by the square root of And again, you do the sums. Zero point six four three two, and we have minus zero point one six nine six. So for the second one, we take our second mode shape, which is 1 and 1.2638, and we divide by the square root of our second modal mass, m2. So we've got 11.5826 square rooted in the denominator for each of those terms. And so again, that gives us another mode shape, which I can write out 0 0.2638.
So our phi term, which is our key, is simply these two vectors lined up. So we've got 0 0.6432 minus 0 0.1696 0 0.2938 and 0 Okay, so that's step five. That's rescaling that process, rescaling the mo uh, the mode shapes. Step six is dealing with our applied force. And the equation for that is if I, uh, let's call my applied force in the modal case, I'll call that P of T, I. Okay, so you take your applied force in the case where you're dealing with x, you multiply, you pre multiply by the transpose of your modal matrix, and that will give you your um, modal forces in a sense. You pre multiply by the transpose of your modal matrix um, times by your force, give you the modal forces. And so in this case, Take the transpose of our modal matrix, so we have the, the di diagonals stay the same, 6, 4, 3, 2, but the off diagonals swap positions. So down here we've got 0 0.2938, and here we've got minus 0 0.1696, and here we've got 0 0.3713. And then we put our force in vector in here. And again, from the equation of motion, we can see quite clearly that that's going to be um, 6t and 0. So that's 6t, and that's 0. So it's quite clear that the first term in my vector is going to be 0 0.632 times by 6 minus 0 0.01696 uh, times by 0. So it's obviously this term times by 6, okay, which should give me 385 Nine zero times by t, and again with this one we've got point two nine three eight times by six, because uh, that that term is multiplied by zero, and that gives me one point seven six three zero, one point seven six three zero times by t. <coughs>
Okay, so now we do step seven. Which is where we apply our values to our modal equations. So step seven. I'll just call this modal equations. So now instead of a bunch of uncoupled equations that we have to solve simultaneously, we have individual equations. And they're always going to be in the form of QI double dot with no damping. So this is no damping because we haven't got damping in the system. Omega I squared QI equals P I T. So quite clearly for I equals 1 we've got Q1 double dot plus omega 1. We've been given omega 1 um, in our solution so we can write it um, I'll just well, I could write it in here. We've got the 14.5 Four eight two squared Q one equals three point eight five nine zero T. And Q two correspondingly. Looks like this. Omega one. So omega two is five point three two four three. One point seven six three zero T. Now this compares with m x double dot plus kx is f t and the solution for that as initial rest conditions is given to you in your equation sheet as minus f divided by k omega naught sine omega naught t plus f t divided by k. So this is the mathematical solution to this with initial rest conditions. So therefore we can apply the same logic 
because we've got an equation here that's exactly the same form as this equation. Okay, so therefore the solution is going to be um, in a very similar form. But what we have to do is we have to substitute for the different uh, coefficients. So here we've got q1 double dot, okay, times by 1, so m must therefore be 1. k is going to be my omega 1 squared, okay, and obviously my f here is going to be this term here, okay, because it's f times t, well there's my t, so f must therefore be that term. And so we can jump straight to the solution to the equation for q1. We've got minus f, so that's going to be 3.8 590 divided by, well here I've got k times by omega naught. Well here's my omega 1. Omega 1 squared we know is k and omega naught in this is going to be my natural frequency. So I take my omega 1. And so I've got down here I've got 14.5482 to the power of 3. Okay, because I've got omega, naught, omega 1 squared times by omega 1. So I get uh, cubed down there. And I have sine 14.5482 times by time plus 0 0.3, I'll be about that, 3.8590 times by t divided by k, which I know is omega squared. 14.5482 squared. So if I do the sums on this equation, Q1 is 0 One eight two three two. So for Q two, I apply the same logic. Here's my equation for Q Q two. Okay, and there's my solution is going to be in this form. So I've got minus. 1.7630 divided by 5.3243 cubed sine 0.3 Apologies, there's a minus sign here.
So that's my solution for Q2. Okay, so I've applied my force here, divided by my omega 2 cubed. Okay. Times my sine of my omega 2 t, and then I've got my force times by time. Okay, matching up with here, divided by omega 2 squared, which is my value for k. And again, you could do the the sums, and you end up getting this equation is Q2. So that's Q1 and Q2. Yes? Because I've got a K times by omega 1. K we know is omega 1 squared times by omega 1, you get omega 1 cubed. Okay. <sighs> so step eight, we convert back to displacements. And for that, we use the equation x. We use that equation for substitution. And so if we make that substitution, we know that x1 and x2 where Q1 and Q2 are what we found here and here. But since it's not a speed writing competition, I'm just going to write it in terms of Q1 and Q2. So if x1 is 0 0.6432 Q1 plus 0 0.2938 Q2, and x2 is minus 0 0.1696 Q1 plus 0 0.3713 Q2.
Okay, so this is a typical two degree of freedom problem. Okay, and it just so happened that with that two with the two degrees of freedom, we were given our equation of motion, which is step one, our natural frequencies, which is step two, and our mode change, which is step three. So we don't need to worry about those three steps. We can dive straight into the new stuff. In step four, we have to find the modal mass. This is the equation in your equation sheet, and you go through the process. So m1, here's our first mode shape transposed, times by the mass matrix, times by the mode shape. Okay, we do two times one, okay, minus, uh, and for the first term in this, in, this, uh, in this vector, and then we can do six times this term, and then obviously you do one times that, and then, you know, uh, that one times that one. Add them together, you get that. And again, the same process for mass 2. It's worth revising if you're unsure about matrix multiplication, how you go about doing that. Okay, level 1 mass. So you get those two values for M1 and M2. Okay, we then rescale the mode shapes using this equation. And so I've got my mode shape 1 at minus 0.2638. I divide by the square root of my modal mass that I get from my M1. So that's on there. Square root it, you put them in the bottom, you end up getting another vector for the mode shape. Do the same process for U2, okay, to get this one. And then you line them up side by side, here and here, to get my phi, which is my modal matrix. Step six, we're dealing with the applied force. There's my equation that I use, where I'm saying P is my modal forces and these are my actual forces. So I've got P1 and P2. There's my modal matrix transposed, because I've got the T here. So I take this matrix, I transpose it by swapping those two terms around. Okay, so that's here, times by my force, mate, force vector, which is 60 and 0. If I multiply those, I get two uh, values, one for P1 and one for P2. Step 7 is dealing with the modal equations. If I've got no damping, then I've got that force in there. Uh, so I've got that equation. If there is damping in the in the um, system, so this is an aside, I end up with QI double dot plus two zeta omega i, that's zeta i as well, QI dot plus omega i squared QI equals P I T. Okay, so if I've if I've got damping in the system, then I've got this extra term in the middle. Okay. That's on the side. In this case I haven't got any damping, so this is my equation. And so I there's my equations written out. I've stuck in my values for omega one and omega two. And there's obviously my forces there. That, this equation compares nicely with this equation. And back in the formula sheet, you can see quite clearly that this is a ramp function. So the total force here is going to increase with time. And we know the solution for the ramp function is this equation with initial rest conditions. So I match up my coefficients. M is 1, K is omega i squared, omega naught is omega i, and F obviously is my P term up here. And so I find the equation for Q1, do the sums, you get that. And I find the equation for Q2 here, do the sums and you get that. Is that step clear? Do you have an equation of a certain form that's got a solution of a certain form? And we're just using the work we did in Chapter 3 to help solve this math equation, the second order differential equation, okay? Well, here's the second order differential equation with that solution. So we can apply, since this is in the same form, we can apply that solution to this problem. That's, what we're, that's all we're doing. So I get a value for Q1 and Q2. And then step 8, lastly, is to convert it back to displacement. So I use this, this process here. And like I said, I've written it in terms of Q1 and Q2. Um, I've written these answers in terms of Q1 and Q2. Um, that's fine. That's acceptable. You don't have to stick these things in for the and there, it just becomes very complicated. And it's not, you know, it doesn't add anything to your understanding or abilities 